Hi everyone. So I'm going to continue now discussing um, basically the last concept that's important as far as the development of quantum mechanics and this is the experiment itself is often referred to as the double slit experiment um, and we'll describe that in, in a little bit and the um, uh, principle that uh, comes along with that is called Heisenberg uncertainty principle. So the slide that shows the double slit experiment is uh, shown here but before I talk about the double slit experiment itself um, what I'm going to do is just show you what happens in a single slit. So in other words, if you just have, you know, electron on this side and you're shooting it uh, through a, um, uh, you know, a, a, con a separator like this and there's one slit in it, uh, what do you expect to see on the detector, okay? And I'm actually going to use this um, animation, uh, you know, uh, that's available also from YouTube. It's fairly good animation to kind of show what's going on in the single slit and double slit experiment okay so basically uh, first off what's going to happen here is that uh, imagine you have a machine that basically can shoot particles okay and they're going to shoot through the particles because the electron is a particle so remember that think about the fact that at that time people thought that the electron is a particle so if you're shooting electrons through which is a particle through a single slit because it's a particle you expect all the particles to land on the same spot and that spot is the spot where the slit is okay you expect all the particles to just line up straight like that on the detector the detector is here at the back okay so if you as you can see shoot this through some of them are re uh, deflected but most of them are going to have that pattern right there right so that would be what you expect the um, you know what you would expect to observe if you were to shoot particles through a single slit. Now, if you then uh, shoot particles through two slits, right, what you expect to happen, of course, is you're going to expect some of the times the particle is going to go through one slit, some of the time the particle is going to go through two slits, and if you do this for a long periods of time, then you should see two patterns here, one here and one here, where the particle hits the detector, okay? And that's what we expect to see for a particle, right? Now, we know, you know, from our discussion in the previous video and also from the introduction to the topic of quantum mechanics that if we have a wave, on the other hand, uh, the pattern that we observe on the detector is not going to be the same like the pattern we observe for a particle. So here's a single slit experiment. Uh, but then you have a wave instead that's going through this. Now wave, of course, wave looks like this. Um, for a single slit, you know, the, the sort of the maxima of the wave here, the, 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 the largest part of the wave is going to hit the middle. So you're going to get a pattern, which is very similar like the pattern of a particle, right? You have something right in the middle, and then you have, you know, less and less intensity as you go to the to the sides okay but the, the strongest part is in the middle now however when you have two when you have two slits right this is something that you should be familiar with because we've seen this before when you have two slits and you have a wave then what do you expect to see here you should be able to answer this at this point and uh, we'll see what happens here if you run through this animation you see that if you have waves right the waves coming in from here and then the waves get split apart and some of the waves will uh, have constructive interference. Some of the waves would have destructive interference. So of course, what ends up happening once the wave reaches the detector, once all these waves reach the detector, is you have parts of them that are bright and parts of them that are dark. And this is, of course, what we refer to as a as a diffraction pattern. Okay. So as you can see, um, you know, as far as wave and particle is concerned when you shoot through something that you consider a particle you only see two pattern one on one sl uh, slit the other one on the other slit when you do a wave you see a diffraction pattern okay so the question now is what happens if we try to do this with the electron okay and remember that people were thinking that the electron was a particle at the time okay so you expect a pattern that looks something like this right if you were to shoot electron I'm just gonna move that back a little bit um, you would expect again 
something that looks like this. There will be one thing and there will be another thing uh, based on the position of those slits. Uh, and then the wave, of course, has a diffraction pattern. Okay. So let's try to do this with uh, the electron. Okay. With a very small particle. And so we're going to shoot now, shoot electron through. Um, first through a, a single slit and you see a pattern that you expect to see for a particle. Now you're going to shoot through a double slit and what's interesting, this is the interesting part here, what's interesting is you get a diffraction pattern when you do this experiment with an electron. So I'm going to go back to now the um, slide itself and this is in fact what was uh, observed is something that looks like this even though what we expect to see if the electron is a particle is something that looks like that you expect only to see two bright lines corresponding to the position of the slits and nothing else but then what you saw is actually an interference pattern which of course suggests that the electron is a wave right because only a wave can generate this kind of pattern so then people were then confused as far as what is the nature of the electron okay so they want to know how exactly is the electron, which is a particle, generate an interference pattern. Because they want to know uh, how it is that you, know, you shoot through one particle, how is it that that particle can somehow split apart or somehow become a wave at this point. So then what they decided to do was look at this, and this is the next slide, to try to look at what happens to the electron as it crosses that slit, okay? They try to shoot electrons and they try to see what happens to the electron as it crosses the slit. And maybe from looking at it, and the looking here meaning that you have, you know, basically some kind of a measuring device like a light, you know, some kind of laser beam of some, or of some sort that's able to detect where the electron is coming out from and as a result figure out how it's forming that interference pattern that we saw earlier. The interesting thing is when you actually turn on the laser light and you look or try to look at the electron, look here again means measuring you know which way the electron is coming out from, that interference pattern that you saw earlier completely disappeared and what you see is just a pattern that you expect out of a particle. Okay. Now this is interesting because the only thing you change in this experiment compared to the previous experiment is the presence of that laser beam because you're trying to detect exactly where the electron is coming out from because you're trying to figure out how is it that it's generating these um, interference pattern. But the fact that you're just putting something to observe the electron changes the behavior of the electron. It completely changes from what looks like a wave before to something that looks like a particle. Okay? So as a result, people then concluded that light itself, you know, when you're trying to see something, you always shine light on it, you know, as a, as a way of detecting that object. And light itself interferes with the way electrons behave. And the reason this is, again, uh, uh, only noticeable for something like the electron you know, is because the electron is very small and the photons of light is actually has enough energy to interact with the electron and change its behavior okay um, we don't see this of course with macroscopic object if I were to shine light on a room I see the chairs I see the uh, you know furniture I see um, plants for example all of these things they don't change their behavior whether the room is dark or the room is uh, lighted, right? They have exactly the same structure and same properties as we, you know, whether we have the room uh, in total darkness or when whether we have the room, uh, you know, completely floored with light. But the electrons, as it turns out, is, is an interesting particle because when there's no light, it behaves like a wave, but when there's light, it behaves like a particle, okay? So that's a uh, result uh, gave rise to this concept called the uncertainty principle, which uh, one way to state that is that when you observe something, you actually 
changes the outcome that you are trying to observe. Okay, you change it. You change the behavior of the object that you're trying to observe. Okay, and the uncertainty principle is often given in this form, in this form of the equation, and this was um, proposed by Heisenberg. And so it's often called the Heisenberg Uncertainty Principle. Heisenberg himself won the Nobel Prize in 1932 for figuring this out. But basically what this equation says, I'm just going to read it out here, delta x times delta mv must be greater or equal to h over 4 pi. What this equation is saying is that if you're trying to look at an object, you need to determine two things, right? An object that's moving, that is, okay? So if you have an object that's moving, you need to look at, you know, if you, if you want to determine, uh, you can determine two things with respect to that particle. You can determine its position, okay, which is what x uh, symbolizes, and you can determine its momentum, which is what mv symbolizes. And what Heisenberg is saying is that the uncertainty with respect to the position of that particle times the uncertainty with respect to, to its momentum has to be at the minimum this value h over 4 pi so this is sort of like the product of the errors that you have in your measurement it has to be at least this number or bigger so what he's saying is that there's a limit to observation you can't have a 100 percent uh, you know precise measurement there's always an error and the smallest error you can get is h over 4 pi now, in the next video, we're going to show how to apply this equation and ask the question again, ask the same question that we asked early, you know, before with the Broly wavelength, which is, why is it that when I look at something like a, a baseball moving, right, I know exactly where the baseball is and I know exactly how fast it's moving, the velocity. In other words, I don't have any uncertainty as far as I can you know, uh, as, I've heard, as far as I can tell when I'm looking at a baseball moving or when I'm looking at a car moving. So the question is, why is it that we don't really see this in our everyday life? We don't see this uncertainty principle in action in our everyday life. And we're going to show that by calculation in the next video.